So for five days straight, if I really wanted to do this perfectly and extract the full amount from this trade, this would be a million dollars in one week. Our guest today is Jordi Alexander, a former pro poker player turned crypto genius and now the founder and CIO at Selini Capital, one of the most successful market making and venture capital firms in the Web3 industry. I basically had to accept destroying my health and not sleeping and feeling like shit for five days for a million dollars. If you want to understand the game theory, you really have to study like evolutionary psychology. Part of our genes and our intuition is based upon millennia of cavemen trying to survive and procreate. Where do you think the human species is going to end with the advancement of AI where we've seen massive breakthrough and progress in the last year? Around the end of the decade, I would expect that certain things about how we live our lives are going to change such a fundamental way that a lot of people will not be prepared for it. This, I got the gray, I went to Harvard, I McKinsey, and then I started, and everything is just sort of like yeah. smoothly done. I had like the most turbulent path that was, took forever to kind of get back on course. And um, I think that led to a lot of depression as well. You were struggling with mental health because of this very kind of volatile childhood in terms of parenting and the way they loved you and in terms of moving to different places and kind of coming back after living in the US. What's your thought on that? You know this saying, like, nice guys finish last? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing, man? I'm pretty good. Very good to see you. You see it. Been chasing you for a while. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you, you have the uh, perseverance that's needed. Oh, I have, oh man, I, there's some people, probably 25, 30 times, and for me, I just take it as a game. Yeah. Everything is a game. <laughs> it's a game. It's the same as dating. You know, you have to uh, show proof of your value. Mm. You know, you use, use some social proof and kind of try to build on that. Absolutely. Uh, that exactly. I want to say, because the game, the dating one is as a man, especially nowadays, more tricky. You can't chase too much. Otherwise, you're going to be seen as a, I mean, they're going to be scared of you, right? Right. Or like with this weird dude. But it's exactly the same. It's true kind of like the modern way of dating is instead of going to these dating apps, it's more, how do I build social capital? Right. And then have kind of them coming to me or wanting to be with me. Yes. Instead of the opposite. Otherwise, we both, I mean, we, we both know that a woman going on whatever Tinder, or I think there's, there's a study on uh, OkCupid okay that um, there's a five out of 10 women who goes on OkCupid. Okay I'm very and, aware of this study. And you, you, you were, yeah. And, and then... Do you want to talk about it, you? Yourself? Oh, sure. So, um, a woman and a man have very different sort of strategies, right? And different goals with dating. And that's because of evolution. So if you want to understand the game and understand the game theory, you really have to have study like evolutionary psychology, which is basically what part of our genes and our intuition is based upon millennia of cavemen trying to do what we're doing here, which is, you know, survive and procreate and that's been done thousands of times. We've adapted as humans to be able to do this really well. And women have their own strengths. Uh, you know, they have an amazing intuition. They can tell if a guy's full of shit. They need to know that, right? If someone is displaying value and it's fake, mm. they need to be able to tell. So they have this amazing intuition. And as men, you know, we have to face the reality that uh, a lot of us are expendable because, you know, sperm is cheap. So if there is 10 women, they can date the same guy and have 10 children. Or they can date 10 different guys. But if, if, if the one guy is like the alpha male, you know, like the gorilla in the group, and he has the better genes and he can display that value, they're kind of predisposed to all liking him. And when you look at these studies, for example, like these okay Cupid studies, mm. women think that most men are not average. They think they're like way below average and they just focus on that right tail. Absolutely. What's the consequence of that? So it, there's a few consequences. One, you know, you can have a lot of uh, unhappy men uh, who might not be getting attention. And, uh, you know, in modern society, I think it's very prevalent as well. Now that it's, it's a lot easier for an alpha male to use social media to display, you know, his, his, his power really uh, to a lot of women. We see men that are sleeping with, you know, hundreds of women and then a lot of men that are having a hard time you know, breaking through and even fighting, finding a, a girlfriend. Do you think that this social media game actually, because it's so easy to fake, you know, 
it's so easy to, I mean, buy, you can buy followers, you can buy views, you can buy clicks, you can, you can rent the Lambo, you can rent the jet. And a lot of dudes are doing that. So for me, it's kind of like understanding that there is a kind of new game out there. But again, I think for women, it's, it, it might be very difficult to navigate. Women are ultimately looking for different things at different ages. When they're in their early 20s, you know, they want the pretty boy, the popular one that's just like fun. That's kind of what they're predisposed. But as they move towards, you know, 30s, thinking about children more, that's where the dynamics change completely. And the it's the most interesting game theory because you're actually looking at mating dynamics where they are considering who to have a child with. And the reality is as men, uh, you know, I've, I've gone through early 20s where it was hard to get the attention of women. They want mm. all, older men who are accomplished. They have their career. They have a lot of money. They have that wisdom as well. And I understand it now being on the other side of it. Um, as you reach like 29, 30, I remember like walking through London and it was like a spring day and it stayed in my mind like this summer day in London, which is quite rare. It's usually like this awful weather there. And for the first time in my life, I just realized that these pretty girls were just looking at me as I was walking in the street. And this never happened before. I'm always the one kind of trying to get attention and, and looking at them. And I realized something changed. And there is this like worldliness and intuition that comes about around that age where if you have started to accomplish something and you have your shit together, you're just attractive to women. They are naturally drawn to that. And it doesn't happen until you have it a bit deeper inside you. It's something they, they feel, something they see. So I would say everything comes together. When you're talking about intuition and, you know, I use this for trading, I use this for life in general, you want to get information from many different places, right? Mm. So one is like a gut feeling. You see someone, the way they act, the way they're, um, you know, micro expressions. I'm a poker player as well. And we're always looking at micro expressions. Subconsciously, we're picking up things, whether we realize it or not about the other person that we're around. Then they might, you know, hear something about you from mm. a common friend. These days they might Google you, look you up. Um, all these things start to add up and then they all come together for value. So you talked about, I mean, we talked about dating and game theory. Do you want to explain very simply, you have a four years old daughter. If you were explaining to your four year old daughter what game theory is and how it relates to dating. So game theory on a very basic level is you're not just playing a one person game. There's other people involved and they're, they're also strategic and also thinking about what to do and also have their own different utility of what they're trying to accomplish. And it's not just me playing solitaire and trying to solve something. I have to predict what the other person is going to do. And if I want to win, achieve a certain outcome, whatever that may be, I can't just think about myself. I need to think about the reaction function of, of somebody else. So when it comes to dating, it's a very clear, not a one player game. I and mean, you, can, you can play by yourself, be at home and you know, do a single, single player uh, dating if you want, uh, but that doesn't get you very far, let's say. <laughs> so um, if you're trying to attract you know, a woman, for example, as a man, you need to understand the things that matter to them and provide them. And sometimes there's a lot of compromise that you have to do. You might not have the same objectives. Can you give some examples of what women want? Yeah, I would say like definitely by far and beyond, they want to be around uh, a man that is successful and treats them well. Um, What's their definition of success? Yeah, you know, you have everything from women that are very money centric and using that as the barometer, mm -hmm. resources, maybe because their ancestors, their grandmothers and great grandmothers, they survived by being around men that were really good at getting resources mm -hmm. and hunting and doing this kind of stuff. You have women that are kind of predisposed to looking at other things, maybe just, um, you know, looks like health, just physical health, markers of that, that could be something that can attract them. Um, there's women that can have slightly different perceptions of uh, what value is. They might have a very social perception, just somebody who is a very artistic person. Mm. And, and that creativity is uh, what will help the offspring survive. 
So that's a really interesting conversation because obviously the reason why we are here today is because of crypto and crypto tends to attract people who are more, I'd say, you know, nerdy or spending a lot of time in their basement as we kind of meme it, but it's probably not completely untrue. So what would you tell these dudes who haven't made it yet, or even who, who have made it in crypto, but don't really know what to do with women? How do they, how should they play this game? Yeah. I mean, the one good thing about a lot of them is that they are at least focused on getting resources and ultimately like that's part of the puzzle. Now there's some that get the resources and then they don't have any social skills. And I've seen many of these people that, um, you know, might not be able to close the loop, but a lot of them are actually not really interested in a stable partner. They are more interested in, you know, models and bottles. Mm. Um, <laughs> they're in that stage of life. So ultimately they'll, they'll go through, through, through their own journey and, uh, and see what matters to them. So it, it's hard to give advice because people might have different preferences of where they're trying to get to, but it's also age dependent for sure. So it's really interesting because you said, you know, when you're a younger guy, like you have some, I mean, women too, but let's talk about men because we are men. So we understand ourselves better than the other sex. When you're a young guy, early twenties, it's difficult because you look like a baby, you don't have money, you don't have resources, you don't have social capital, you have nothing, basically. but you, you don't necessarily understand it. You're like, what's going on? It's, it's hard, you know? Whereas your woman counterpart, same age, 21, 22, amazing time, right? They're the top of the chain at that age, for sure. So then there's a theory that says, oh, guys, it's between 28 and whatever, 35 or 40 that they're at their prime age. So that's not the moment that you settle down. Because if you didn't settle down when you were at your prime age, 21, 22, 23, why should I, when I am at my prime age, which is much later on, you know, I had to, to do all these, uh, this hustle and to get there, right? And, and even a lot of people will never get there, but like I did all this, didn't sleep for nights or even weeks, as we'll talk about later. And now I'm there, right? But that doesn't really, if everybody thinks that way, like how, how does What's the human the tissue even What's the, evolve? Yeah. So the game theory solution, I would say one is, there is a natural age gap that is probably healthy between men and women so that they can survive together for more years. Mm. So I would say five years is, is, is very healthy, for example. If you have a woman at 24 and a guy at 29, they're quite close still in terms of, you know, one's reaching their peak as a man. The woman is still like in her peak, but, you know, will have quite a few years uh, through it. Mm. At some point when you... Um, look very far in the future, that might change. A lot of our behavior is driven by hormones and those hormones are, you know, we're predisposed. Like when we have a child, we'll, we're gonna feel a lot of very strong, you know, neurotransmitters uh, creating a very strong bond with our child so that we provide for them. And that same might exist for the partner as well. After three to five years, we're naturally like, you know, children start to become more robust. They're not going to be as uh, scared of, not not surviving at that point these hormones sort of calm down and if there's not a very strong partnership you can see a lot of divorces happen i mean most people still get divorced today it's like almost 60 percent divorce rate and we can imagine that out of the other 40 percent there's a ton of people who are unhappy and they're just staying together into old age because of societal pressures or because of because the kids until 18 or 25 or because of habits or because of habits of... kids resources like the woman mm -hmm. hasn't worked and she actually kind of has to stay around and it creates a really bad dynamic because if there's codependence and the woman is depending on the man he will start treating her badly naturally you know it's mm -hmm. in our system to for the people that we take for granted because they can't they don't have a choice um they will start treating us badly and i think as a man you know, you want to find this balance where you're not taken for granted, but you're also not avoiding any security. You want to give some security, but not be taken for granted. How do you get there? Well, I, you know, I've, I've had my journey. I started on the very like nice guy side of things. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was about becoming a bit more of an asshole. What does that mean being nice versus being an asshole? So, you know, the saying like nice guys finish last. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I kind of went through that trajectory in life I would say like giving out free meals and dinners to women <laughs> <laughs> I, I was quite a sensitive 
guy growing up, I think um, maybe like overly sensitive and just trying to be very nice to people. Mm -hmm. And the first girlfriend I had, you know, I was 17 years old. Um, she was 15 and we dated for a very long time, like almost a decade on and off. You know, we were fighting, like breaking up, getting back together. But the thing that I was always doing during this time was I, I really was kind of like a romantic guy, flowers, gifts. Um, and people would say about me like, oh, like he's, you know, he's a really nice guy. Yeah. The reality I learned <laughs> is that they lose respect. They lose respect and not just lose respect, mm. like they can keep the respect, the respect can be there, but they lose attractiveness because there's something about like an alpha male that's not yeah. nice. Like the alpha male will just grab something if it's there and, and give it and, you know, give it to the people that he's protecting, let's say. You'll become the best friend, basically. You become the best friend and somebody else can step in, right? So yeah. I lived through that. Um, you know, it wasn't fun. And happens to everyone. Happens to everyone. Happens would... to everyone. <laughs> I would say it happens to everybody that starts from being very nice. Some people uh, definitely like, I know uh, a lot of young men that don't start off the nice way. They're, they're starting on the very like asshole approach. And then hopefully over time, they learn how to mellow out and uh, kind of balance themselves the other direction. I think uh, it's Jordan Peterson who talks about that, the five characters. He said there is these um, engineers who made the research on, it's actually on porn websites, What are the five characters that women that are the biggest fantasies of women? And it's a uh, doctor, pirate, millionaire, uh, billionaire, um, policeman, or fireman, something like that. And basically, the whole concept around it is they want someone who is kind of a bad person, was the power, but that they can tame. That's their kind of like biggest fantasy. Yeah, they want to tame the wild animal. Um, <laughs> like I can see like. <laughs> Even, you know, my daughter, she likes horses. They, they get obsessed with these kind of creatures that are, you know, powerful, but, you know, you can make them nice and, and train them. And that's innate in, in women, I think. So how do you do this transition from being nice to being less nice? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was, uh, it was a deep ditch when I had to redesign just the very core of myself. I would say it took a good year of, like, depression, really, and... Uh, hitting like the lows of my life. When was that? So I was about 26 years old. Um, after this breakup that I had put so much of my heart and like self uh, image into, right? Like my identity was sort of tied up into yeah. all of this. I reached the point where I had to accept it was going to end. It was not healthy. So I had to kind of be the one to just completely cut um, communication because it, it was breaking me apart having to deal with that instability. And I went on this like very negative spiral, sort of like crypto, you know, you, you have bad news and the price goes down and that causes more people to sell and you just have like liquidations. So I, I got fully liquidated. I was, I was at the bottom of like, you know, March, 2020, like I, I, I was there. Right. So what it means is like your health goes down the drain, like yeah. your, your financial life is not going well. You know, for me at the time, I was still a professional poker player and you can imagine trying to sit down and gamble for thousands of dollars when you're- It's impossible. It's a very bad idea. <laughs> we're one, we're, that's one key thing, which I mean, now people understand more, but in previous generation, they were always saying, there's the professional you, and then there's the like real you, and it's different. At, at least for me, it's never been possible. Like I've been building businesses since I'm 23. So I don't have a boss. So like maybe it's even worse because I don't have someone telling me you need to do that. But like when my mental health is not good, Like I can't, I can't. I can't well, you know, it, good at work is impossible. A hundred percent. It does depend even more like what type of work you're doing. If you're doing something, you know, physical, you're showing up, you're a security guard, whatever. Okay, like maybe you can just be professional and do your job. If you're relying on creativity, intuition, um, you know, peak performance, like mm -hmm. mental performance, then it's impossible. And I definitely found myself playing games that were out, out of my bankroll, you know, really, really the highest stakes games. I had more gamble than I should have had. Um, and I probably wasn't even making the best decisions. So I lost like a chunk of my bankroll, um, which, you know, starts worsening your psychological condition even more. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like revenge trading, basically. It's a it's, was revenge life, life poker. <laughs> it's definitely like that sort of tilt uh, psychological ditch that you try to bring yourself out of. 
And I really tried to find a way out of that ditch. Like you realize that you're in a bad place. You want to come out mm. and you need something to help you. I think you need like a helping hand to kind of pull you out because otherwise you might not have the ability to create enough positive thoughts and bring enough positive um, opportunities to yourself to do it. What, what was the rock bottom for you that year? Rock bottom, I think. Um, what made you realize, man, I need to get my shit together. This is too much. Yeah. So I, I, I've talked about this a little bit in, in the past uh, in, in a tweet I wrote, but there was a, a day that I was kind of in my own depression, mind, anger, driving really late at night. Um, I think it was like 2 a.m. I had gone to some party and I was going home. I wasn't drunk, but I was just in my thoughts and in my kind of anxiety. And, you know, it was fun to speed. There's nobody else on the road. I had a sports car. Um, and I just, you know, I don't know how, how fast I was going. I wasn't looking, but it was, it was fast. And a car on my left lane, it was quite far ahead. Um, but maybe, you know, it assumes that everyone on this road is going, let's say 60 kilometers an hour. Let's say I was going 120. Um, so at some point, this car that was further down just assumed that they can, they can make a right turn. So they, they start crossing right into my lane. Mm. I was going way faster than they had realized. I was, I was almost, you know, there. And it was on one of those moments where things slow down suddenly and everything goes like very slow motion. And I just remember everything on playing, unfolding in front of me where this guy had his girlfriend, I guess, in the, in the passenger seat. And as he was turning right, I was just directly confronted with the door and I could see her in the window and I'm accelerating. I mean, I'm trying to slow down at this point, but it's, it's not going to happen. Like there's no way I'm going to be able to slow down in time. So you start thinking a hundred miles an hour, like, what do I do at this point? And, uh, my reaction, my gut reaction was just like, okay, like, I, I, I cannot crash into this car right now. Like I will not live with myself. Yep. So there's no point in doing anything, but swerving and just hoping for the best. Like, I don't know if I'm going to die. It's very possible. Um, but I just, you know, I, I took a swerve and just crashed into a building. because that was like the only thing there. Um, Thankfully, like there happened to be this like fan conditioner box outside in front of the building. Mm. So it kind of slowed down the crash, even though, you know, the car is of course like totally wrecked and everything is like fuming. And, you know, I, I got very badly injured. Like my knee was, um, was kind of screwed up for a long time after that. But that was definitely a wake up call that like, I didn't really need it. I knew that I was in a bad place, um, but it, it showed me even more that, I desperately need to do something about this. What's really interesting is we would think that with these mental health things, we would think that people who are very, very intelligent and very analytical should be able to kind of, you know, dissect the thing and first say, okay, I don't feel good, right? Obviously it's more difficult because you're fucked already. So like it's more difficult to realize what's going on, but I don't feel good. And then start to think in a very logical manner What are the reasons why I'm not good? And what are for each of these potential reasons a solution? And then start to work on that. But in theory, right? In practice, it's much more difficult. You can be the smartest people in the world and you, everybody is at the same level against these I, mental health I, issues. I think, I think some people are better than others. At the time, at the age I had, I didn't have a lot of these like organized structures, you know, Uh, the way you talk is something that I didn't even know at the time that, you know, you put it out and you lay it out and you say, you know, let, let me be logical about this. Let me be systematic and look through. This is kind of what I've learned in the last decade of my life, doing trading, doing all these things and being systematic. And I think I would approach things differently. But at the time, I was just very emotional. I hadn't really gotten control of my ego. Um, it was It was still like, you know, full of insecurities, full of frustration. I felt like throughout my my 20s, I knew I had a lot of talent and I hadn't found a, a way to properly make use of it. Mm -hmm. And this, this led to a lot of like insecurity and frustration with, with myself. Um, those things become a lot easier to deal with once you have structures and once you have a healthy ego. And that's sort of what changed my life. I would say over that year, this is going to sound a bit lame, um, but you know, this concept like a spirit animal, 
Mm-hmm. It's a bit of a Asian concept, I guess. But um, for me, do you want to explain it for the audience who doesn't know? Yeah, I mean, you know, some people feel very um, close to the characteristics of, of an animal, right? Like mm-hmm. whether it's a, a deer or a unicorn or a bird or a fish, you know, different things. And there's different reasons why they feel that they resonate with it. Um, I think it when you when you find an animal that you feel talks to your spirit and like this is a part of you, this is who you are, it's your subconscious telling you to try to like direct your attention to those characteristics because that's sort of where you'll find your your peace. And for me, I realized that my spirit animal is a black dragon. Okay. Which is a mythical creature, but um, I was playing some computer game. I think it was like, you know, might and, Heroes of Might and Magic or whatever. And there and there was these dragons. There's different dragons. There's green dragons and, you know, different ones. But they're the most powerful creature in, in the whole uh, game is the black dragon. And the thing that it, it spoke to me was it's not good or bad it's just powerful it doesn't try to do harm but if you fuck with it it'll come at you and it just tries to make itself independent and strong and it's not trying to help or hurt hurt anybody and that kind of gave me the balance i needed to direct my personality i think did you do some sort of therapy also or it's all you did all this kind of thinking on your own So this is a challenge I still have to the day. Um, I do everything by myself. I think it's maybe one of the weaknesses that I still have. Why do you do everything by yourself? I think I learned this way from a very young age. You know, I had to be an adult. You know, my parents got divorced very young and my father left. I had to watch over my mother who was like an emotional wreck. And from like the age of 10, 11, 12, I had to be able to take care of things by myself. I got into this habit where it's very painful and it's very difficult, but if you actually get through it and you survive, it's better than somebody helping you. You've, you've like learned so much from the process that you can then use for, for the next stage. And I've done this for so many years now where I go through periods of just, you know, excruciating difficulties that I could try to get a therapist and get a counselor and get get all kinds of people to help. And maybe to my detriment, I know you can look at it both ways, but I just fight through. And then once I make it through, I'm on, I'm on the other side and uh, there's something that it, it gives me. Do you think this is tied to ego? Um, no, it doesn't come from a place of ego for me. I think... It's just uh, something that's worked. And if it keeps working, I just keep doing it. If if I realize at some point that I, I need help to get to the next level, um, I've recently been thinking like, you know, should I get an executive coach? I go through these thoughts. Um, sometimes I'll, you know, try something for a little bit and it, it will help. But I have been rather individual in my, in my self-development. Richard Woz said, the ego is the single biggest obstruction to the achievement of anything. Do you agree with this? Like 100%. I mean, I have seen my life completely change once my ego is um, under control. And I see it in a lot of young people these days. I think maybe what you mentioned about social media creates a lot of anxiety, both for females and males, at a, you know, under 30 years old. And they're trying to show off to their friends, to the world. They want to show that they're good. They're, they're popular, they're pretty, and they have money, you know, even if <laughs> it's, it's just sort of like getting an expensive watch when they could barely afford it, this type of thing. Um, coming from that place, you're not going to be able to achieve much. You're going to keep getting in, in your own way. Mm. This is a really interesting one, the ego one, because what I realized is I mean, it's very, it's basically completely tied to your insecurities and it's actually ego. It's not a, it's not a necessarily a bad thing or kind of an evil, but people need to understand. And I've saw that in previous relationships that the ego, you built your ego because you've been through really hard yeah. shit in your life. It's a defense mechanism. Exactly. It's a defense mechanism. And the p- problem with it is it's not very helpful, especially later in life and especially in real relationship 
that are already hard, you know, uh, uh, with other people. And so when you see, I mean, the reason why people always talk about communication, right? The problem of everything is communication in a company, in a you know marriage, in a relationship. Like but one of the key problem why communication is bad is because people have this ego that they developed and kind of cultivated throughout their life because a lot of people had a tough childhood like you had. And, um, and the problem is at some point you need to, in a relationship, it's basically, or in, in a business relationship, when you build a company, one, one of the biggest reason why companies fail is not product market fit or running out of cash is founder problem. Like to just one or the other leaving and it, it happens all the time, but no one talks about it. And it's all the time linked with the freaking ego. Even if it's, it's just so one unhelpful. of them, it doesn't even have to be both of them. Even if one founder has this issue, it'll spread and it'll create a problem. Mm. And I have this issue myself, you know, as a founder, I have to decide which one is better, like having somebody support you and having somebody where you can take a break and they, they take they take the wheel and they can drive or risking that you're going to have a misalignment of vision with a co-founder. So we said you have a daughter, you have a life co-founder. I think like one of the things that I've always known was that I do want to have children mm. and always, or it came later on. No, I always knew. I thought I was kind of potentially okay with not having children. I went through life thinking, oh, I'll leave it up to the girl. You know, if she wants them, I'll have them. If not, like that, that's fine. That's the nice dude side. That's, you know, <laughs> I, I, it was all about the partner, right? Mm. I was more focused on the woman, the partner. Mm. And then at some point uh, when I was like, 28, 29, 30, I dated somebody briefly that, you know, she was really clear. She, she did not want to have kids. And it was the first time that I was actually confronted with that because before it was a theoretical concept, like, oh, I'll leave it up to the, to the woman. She'll decide and I'm fine with either decision. But when she actually said that and, and she meant it, uh, I realized I, I was like kidding myself. Like, no, like I'm actually not okay with that. I realized it's such a fundamental or organic part of, um, you know, my, my genes really to, to procreate that I would not want to deny that to myself. Why would we, why would we even be on earth if it's not to procreate and have children? It doesn't make any sense. I right. know you spend a lot of time thinking about the meaning of life. Yeah. What's the meaning of life and how did having a daughter kind of help you in your search for the meaning of life? So it not only helped in the search, I think it's just part of that process mm -hmm. where you, if you think from first principles and you go to the end and you say, what, what, what the fuck are we doing here? Like, mm -hmm. why are we here? <laughs> where, where are we trying to go, right? And there's questions we can't answer. We're like chipmunk, chipmunks, right? Like squirrels and we're trying to solve this like algebra calculus. It's very hard to do it. We don't have the ability to do it. Like trying to understand like what is the purpose of earth and, and the so and solar system, all these things, we don't know. <laughs> And what I concluded is the only way forward is to make the next generation better than us. And then maybe they'll figure it out. Mm. So that's what we can do is provide the path for, you know, the future of humanity or, or you know, our ancestors to eventually be able to go down that path. And once there's super intelligence and once we evolve, you know, in a thousand years, They'll, they'll manage to find that meaning. Because for us, it's not going to be possible in our lifetime, probably. So it's basically the concept of leaving a legacy. Yeah, so like when you play but chess. Not, not money-wise, right? It's, it's really, or building thing is more like life. It's definitely not money-wise. It's, it's definitely all about creating a better version of, of the previous generation. So that it's moving. You want this growth. You need like this exponential growth to keep happening into the future. And... I see it a lot as, you know, I, I played a lot of chess growing up and sometimes you can't calculate all the moves. You know, when you're early in the game, you can calculate five moves ahead. And if you keep focusing, maybe you can do 10 moves ahead, but ultimately you can't go through the end. And this is kind of how I feel about the meaning of life. We can't see through to like the, the final move in the checkmate. We don't know where it is. All we can do is play a move that is good on the board and things will like develop by themselves as, you know, there's a counter move by, by the opponent who in this case is like the universe and the, we'll keep making moves and trying to progress and we can't predict the full, the full finish. 
what made you start thinking about the meaning of life? Is it some bad moments or is it just making a lot of money and then realize this doesn't make me any happier? <laughs> like I'm kind of lost still, which happens to a lot of people. Yeah. You know, like how did you start thinking about that? And uh, because I also realized in my life, the moment I started to think about these things is actually the moment I don't feel good. Um, no, for me, it was just from a very young age, trying to piece together the universe and what, you know, these basic questions of, are there aliens? Like what's out there sort of looking when I, when I look at the, the sky and look at the, the moon, I'm realizing that we're just like this little rock and we're insignificant mm. and trying to make a meaning of that is, is sort of where it starts. And I'll say one thing, money has made me a lot happier. I don't know who these people are that like, it, it, you know, they're like m m we'll worse get, off. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> so are there any aliens? Probably. Very probably, probably right? It's probably. impossible if, if you think about how many planets and stars there are that we would be the only one here. Like it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But the scary thing is, I don't know if you know about this great filter theory, but there is, there's the idea of, you know, if there's all these aliens, why haven't they come here? Why haven't we seen them? And there's two options. Either it's such a rarity to get through a, the filter of survival to be able to get to intergalactic travel mm -hmm. that it's extremely unlikely that we're going to make it through because we haven't yet gone through the filter. And that's quite a scary thought because it means, you know, we're going to eventually end up like everybody else ended up, which is probably making ourselves extinct through like some nuclear bombs or through, through AI. There's, there's multiple paths by which we can imagine aliens and other civilizations just reaching the end of their, uh, their existence that it might be very similar to ours. They might be just creating an artificial uh, creature that kills them or it could be just a nuclear reaction. So that's one, but you said there's another. Yeah, the other one is like the more optimistic, which is that, you know, it's so rare what we've already achieved as humanity, having gone to, you know, the ape and, uh, you know, from a single cell organism to where we are now, that that was the hard part. And we we're through that filter. And now it's actually fine because we are the very few in, in, in the whole galaxy, maybe that have made it through. And maybe there's no other aliens that have made it through. And we're very unique in that case. What about, I mean, both are very interesting. I thought about something much more simple, which for me seems just logical. Mathematically, it's impossible that there is no one else, right? But I was just thinking the reason we don't see them or just because we have our senses and with our eyes or our ears or our smell, we're just not able to see them. So they might be just around, the, uh, around us, but we just can't see them because we just have our own human program. So you're kind of getting into, I guess, parallel universes or, or potentially <laughs> like metaphysics, which, um, it's going to be the topic for another day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do I need to understand about your early context to understand the Jordi who is sitting in front of me today in this podcast studio on this uh, beautiful day of Choptober? Sure. <laughs> Look, like there's lessons that I've learned that are applicable to everybody, but just for context, there were certain benefits and certain, uh, you know, hindrances that I grew up with. Mm -hmm. And I was born, I would say with, um, you know, a lot of intelligence. It was kind of clear from a young age, I could solve problems uh, very quickly and learn things quickly. So I did have that advantage. How do you realize that? Because people tell you? They told me all the time. It became like part of my ego and self-identity. Mm. Like, oh, you're so smart. Like this was from like, you know, age three, I was playing chess and uh, it was just <laughs> okay. always very clear. So this was, you know, eventually unhealthy because it, it sort of tied my reality to, to this concept. But, you know, I have to say that like, I wasn't stereotypical in, in that sense. My parents were both, you know, my grandparents, farmers, right? Like rural in Cyprus, just, uh, no education, just kind of figuring stuff out where they were. And then you grew up in Cyprus. I grew up in the US actually in okay. Boston. Uh, my parents were the first of their generation to go to college or know about college. And they made that, that leap from farmers to Harvard PhDs, university professors, both of them. Wow. So I would say like there was like a unique kind of genetic choosing there that I had naturally from, from that spot. 
But the downside was there was no like culture in my family of how to adapt to, you know, the modern world really, or like even um, how to deal with money or things like this. My parents, while very academically intelligent, were lacking a lot of emotional sophistication. And as a child, I didn't get any nourishment or any direction. It was sort of like, you know, they gave me the genes and just like told me to study hard. And, and, and that like, you know, that was it. Like they were all in their own worlds. They were so different to each other as well. You know, they say like opposites attract. And mm. I think from a genetic sense, it makes sense. Like you want the children to balance out the things that are very extreme about you. So you can have two, two opposites attract, but then they, you know, they're not going to stay together after they, after they procreate. And that's kind of what happened to, uh, to my family. Very soon after it was clear that my father is super logical, just a very math focused, you know, you, you, I, I still like remember when, when I was a kid, I read one of his uh, book reviews on Amazon and it says like, the math in this book is like going to make you cry. Like it, it's like painful for, for like students to try to read the math. Okay. And my mother, she can't even like think about, you know, five plus five. She's just a very emotionally based creature. You know, she writes a lot of um, psychology and, uh, you know, things about politics and stuff like this, but just complete opposites. So I was born in this world of seeing extremes. I went from living in, uh, you know, the US to then having to move to Cyprus, which, you know, especially 20 years ago, we're talking about like you know, first world place, yeah all the, all the resources, everything there. And then you go to a, it's not a third world country, but it's definitely, at the time it was second world at the Where time. Where in Cyprus? So Nicosia, like the capital, okay. which is, a, you know, it's an intense place. It's not on the beach and having yeah. fun. It's, it's sort of a serious place there. There's, um, yeah. <laughs> so, so you grew up in the US, then you moved back to Cyprus yeah. and then what? It was a very so, hard transition. So there. you were 20, uh, 19 years old. No, no, I was, I was like 13, 14, did high okay. school there. Um, yeah, different world, had to adapt. I think it was very good for me having to, you know, be around different culture, different language. You start to realize that a lot of the assumptions that you make about the world, they, they instantly get broken. Because you think that, oh, like, you know, this is how buildings are. This is how children are. This is how people <laughs> treat you. And then you just get completely different Then you go to the Mediterranean side of Cyprus, oh, yeah, completely different. Wow. Yeah. How did you leave that as a 13, 14 years old? I was major? quite upset. I didn't want to leave the US. Um, I was flourishing there. I was actually on a path to doing extremely well um, in school and everything else. And it derailed me in life quite a bit. And it took me like 15 years to recover. I was, you know, in high school where First of all, there was a lot of anti-American sentiment. And even though my parents were, were Cypriot, like I was 100% by blood Cypriot, they treated me as an American. And I got bullied a lot by like, you know, the big kids, especially I'm a prime target for bullying because I have, um, you know, the achievement and the intelligence. Mm -hmm. And I'm also like very relaxed and easygoing. So it's not usually like the nerd who gets bullied. It's the, it's the one who is like too cool for school because he, he doesn't play by the rules. And uh, I, I was kind of an easy target for bullying. I would stand up to myself very aggressively. I wouldn't like let things get past and ended up in a lot of fights. And, uh, you know, I was always sort of getting in trouble, but not the one getting in trouble because that would manipulate the situation to, I got people expelled from school. Like they would mess with me and then I would get them, get them kicked out. Too smart. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so how, how many years did you stay in Cyprus? Did high school there and then, you know, trying to go to college in the U.S., this is sort of a point where I, th I think if I had stayed in the U.S., I would have probably gone to, you know, top school, gone to like, you know, Princeton or something like that, mm. and then just sort of rolled through where I would have the opportunity to work at McKinsey for a few years and then blah, blah, just kind of do the standard stuff. You what I wanted to, to do too. What's that? I wanted to be a McKinsey consultant too. <laughs> I mean, you, you talked to uh, the founder of uh, Antler, right, Marcus? Absolutely. Yeah. I saw this uh, interview and he's just like, yeah, this, I got the gray, I went to Harvard, I McKinsey, and then I started, and everything is just sort of like yeah. smoothly done. I, I had like the most turbulent um, path that was, took forever to kind of get up, get back on course. And um, I think that led to a lot of depression as well. 
um, as so we talked only, about. So not only in that year where you broke up, but even before that, you were struggling with mental health because of, I mean, this very kind of volatile childhood in terms of parenting and the way they loved you and in terms of sort of moving to different places and kind of coming back to a third world country after living in the US. Yeah, I, I think I definitely used my ego as, as a defense mechanism. Mm. I, I see very clearly this like way of being insecure and overcompensating for it by being like overconfident. So people would think I'm arrogant, but I, I was actually acting insecure because I didn't feel that I could back up, um, you know, the talent that I had in a way. And even after when I started to be successful, I did have a little bit of a imposter syndrome for, for some years. Like that was a, a struggle where people were treating me as if, you know, I'm this like, you know, extremely successful guru. Mm -hmm. And I felt that I hadn't earned it yet, especially with crypto, you know, getting into crypto, I put a few uh, thought pieces out there and ended up being right about various topics. And I was treated with like reverence, like this guy, like, you know, let's follow him, let's figure him out. And I went from, you know, having two followers to having, you know, let's say like 50,000 qu pretty quickly. And uh, I definitely had some imposter syndrome at that, at that stage. Why do you think so many successful people experience imposter syndrome? I think it's healthy. It kind of shows that you're starting from a place of, you don't just assume that you, you, you have it, you need to see it in action. It's actually healthier to have to prove to yourself over and over again that I can achieve results, I am making good decisions. And then you can overcome the imposter syndrome by witnessing that you're correct. So that's the way. That's the way. Okay. Now I'm at the other extreme of it now. I feel like having gone through imposter syndrome and, and feeling undervalued, it's kind of like crypto where, you know, the fundamentals actually improve a lot, but the price hasn't improved. And I think I'm, a, I'm a little, I feel a little bit slept on now. So how do you go from being, from doing high school in Cyprus to becoming a poker player? to building a market making firm in crypto. What's the journey there? Yeah, the, the high school was sort of like the way I spent time was playing games. I played like international level chess, bridge, and started to get into poker around 18. And I had a natural knack for games and probability. I could always kind of fluidly look at probability distribution and, and feel it, which is, is kind of a rare skill I've realized. So in college, I played a lot of poker, um, managed to do quite well. I made a lot of money. I could pay my own tuition. Um, it was in the US. In the US, yeah. Wow, this, okay. this was an opportunity to um, kind of cut ties with my father as well because he was very controlling and telling me what classes to take and what to do because he was paying. Um, and I've, I've faced this a few times in my life where somebody has like short-term financial control over me mm -hmm. and I have to play by the rules, but then as soon as I'm able to escape that, there's like this freedom that comes from that. Um, What's your relationship with your parents today? Uh, so good relationship with my mother. I don't, I haven't spoken to my father in, you know, since that like over a decade. Wow. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Um, is it because he's not making any too much ego? Too much ego. Definitely. On his side. Yeah, yeah, 100%. percent so you're waiting for him to come back? I'm not waiting. Yeah, you know, I think I waited for a couple of years um, where I thought that maybe like he would kind of be able to get his shit together and understand that he was wrong about how he behaved. But um, I would say at, at this point, it doesn't really kind of cross my mind. It's something that I know was the right decision to do. And I feel a lot healthier because you don't have this psychological drag of, somebody treating you as if, um, you know, you're, you're disappointing them or uh, there's something that you should be doing differently than who you actually are. And you can just be yourself. That's very interesting. So you're in the camp of saying, like, like a kind of toxic relationship with a woman, you should cut it even if it's your parents. Because there's another camp that says, oh, my parents, they kind of traumatized me one way or another. But for me to feel better about the whole thing, I should go and kind of, you know, they tried to do their best. They did their best anyway. And it's probably coming from a place of love and their own trauma with their own parents, the yeah. way they acted with yeah, me, yeah. right? And so because I understand that, I will make the effort, even if I know that his ego 
is still going to be there forever. You never thought about that. I, I mean, thought probably about you that. did, but yeah. But I think it's still unhealthy and you still need to get away, even mm -hmm. if you can excuse it. So I'm not angry at anybody. And, mm -hmm. you know, this is kind of like the, the way you find peace. You, you lose the anger because you say all those things that you said, like people go through their own childhood, their own journey. They have their own scars and that's why they act a certain way and have their own de defense mechanisms. And I understand it. I'm actually very tolerant of, um, you know, most people's imperfections and uh, their strategies for life because it's, it's fucking hard. Mm -hmm. So I understand it, but... You know, there's still uh, an element of, okay, like if the snake is going to bite you and it's poisonous, like mm -hmm. you can not be angry at the snake, but you still don't want to be around it. <laughs> what would you do if he came back today? Um, Just see if he changed and if there was a way to have a healthy dynamic or not. So you cut ties when you become kind of financially independent thanks to poker? Was poker a way to say, I'm going to become financially dependent? Or it's something you really wanted to do as a professional career? I didn't want to do it as a professional career. I think um, it was the best way to achieve financial dependence for, for a short period of time. I love the game and I love playing, but I'm not somebody that... There's a scalability problem with, with poker, right? Like even if you're very good, you're playing one table, let's say you're managing to beat it at like $100 an hour, $1,000 an hour. At the end of the day, you have to sit at that one table and give your time for money. And you have to make this exchange. Even if you're playing online, you're playing 10 tables and each one is making like $200. So you're making $2,000 an hour. It's still an exchange that doesn't scale for forever and doesn't make me comfortable that it achieves the growth that I want to achieve for myself. What's your craziest poker story that you want to share with us? Oh. the most fun one because I'm sure there's people <laughs> who want to understand actually on Twitter I read a bunch of comments of people asking you to talk about poker I mean poker I still play a lot not a lot uh, in terms of hours but a lot in terms of when I do it I'll go to Vegas you know every June World Series of Poker I'll play 10, 15 events I'll really try to focus on it for like three weeks and take those lessons that I learn at the table and, and bring them to like the rest of my year uh, with trading, with with business, with everything else. And I don't just play to fuck around. I mean, I'm playing against the very, very best, the top players at the highest stakes and trying to compete with them and beat them. Um, so it puts me in some interesting spots. I get very excited having to, you know, match up against people who are doing this for their entire lives. They're very well known and I get to just butt heads against them. So I've had I've had some fun stories, um, you know, playing against Phil Helmuth, for example, who is a funny character. But we've we've had a lot of tournaments. We bust each other out. Um, I still remember a couple of years ago there was the uh, fifty thousand players championship. So this event is not the main event of the World Series, which is you know ten thousand people play and put put ten k and and it's sort of like a, a nice uh, lottery ticket. This is a very different event. This is just 100 people, the top pros. They play against each other. They put 50,000 each, so it's a higher buy-in. Very few people can afford this level of buy-in. And they play a variety of games. So they didn't just play Texas Hold'em. They play, you know, 10 different games. Omaha, Stud. You really have to be good at everything. Mm. So it's called the Players' Championship. And uh, on day one, I'm sitting with, uh, you know, they're all killers, right? Like, there's no bad players in the field. But I'm sitting, sitting with, uh, with Phil Helmuth. And uh, a hand comes up where I think I played very correctly. I don't think I made any mistakes, but we ended up all in where uh, he had a very, very good hand. He was very excited how you put the chips in. He had a set of, uh, of, of deuces. He had like flopped jack five deuce and he had, he had two deuces. So he had three of a kind. And when we, won, when we went all in, he was just like so excited and sure that he was going to win. I flip my hand over and he, he realizes that he's actually behind um, and he gets busted and, and loses the tournament. And he just sat on the rail instead of going home and just accepting that, you know, and let me like refresh for the next day. He spent maybe like 45 minutes just standing with the fans and just glaring at me straight, like with his hate in his eyes. He, he couldn't get over the fact that I had busted him and he was so angry and upset about it that he just gave me like the evil eye for 45 minutes. Um, 
So that was, you know, a lot of people were laughing and, and making fun of him, but it was it was actually kind of nice to see that people care that much mm. about about results. Did you watch Molly's game? I have watched it, yeah. What did you think of it? Especially, and I want to kind of like think about the gambling uh, aspect, which is very prevalent in, I mean, in Asia. A lot of, if I look at a lot of friends, women, whose father lost the entire, you know, family net worth, they had to downgrade house. It's a big problem. If I look at crypto, basically a 27, it's basically a 27 casino. Yeah. Where people, we talk about the crazy success stories, but actually there's many more people who get completely wrecked and lose everything and commit suicide. And yeah. What's, what's your thought on that? So, and how much of the game, how much people are actually, because obviously you're talking about top 100 people, so it's people who are performing at a very high level, it's very different from gambling, but it's probably a kind of gambler in every one of us. Yeah, I think some people deal with, you know, the, the dopamine from gambling in a way that they get addicted to it and they lose sight or perspective and there's people that can handle it. I'm definitely on the side of, I can, I can manage it. I don't get sort of addicted in, in the gambling side. I've been around people that I've just been shocked at the levels to which they'll make bad decisions based on having this gambling rush. There was uh, one guy, this is like when I decided like I'm never gambling again. Um, I was playing uh, in Vegas in one of these years a long time ago. And this guy had come in from Greece and he had somehow gotten really lucky in some tournament. He got like second place or something in some tournament. He won $300,000, which, you know, I don't need to tell you, but if you're living in Greece, mm. this is a lot of money. I mean, you can, you can live off it for a long time and, and do a lot of good. Later that night, we're in the casino. He's sitting at the blackjack table playing, like, you know, just messing around. And I think he, he lost like 5K, which is not fun, but okay, it's not the end of the world. He lost his mind. He started just doubling down, doubling down and, and not being willing to accept like a 5K loss, even though th that day he had just, you know, made 300,000. Mm. So he starts going into this deep hole where he's just betting like 5K chips as if they're candy and just like throwing them on, on the Aria blackjack table. They put him in the VIP room, you know, they're calling for drinks and, and this guy's like, he's just like so into it. He's losing, losing, losing. I think he goes down to like 10,000 from 300,000. He, he lost 290,000, goes down to 10,000. And here's the funny part. He starts getting on a hot streak. He bets, wins, bets, wins. And then he makes it almost all back. So like psychologically, this guy went from like losing it all to, you know, let's, let's say he was back at like 280 or something. He couldn't stop. We were like dragging him. Like all his friends were just like just pulling him in from the table and he would just get angry like leave me alone I, like you know just let, let me do my thing and then i saw the worst thing i ever saw in my life he tells one of them he says go bet on roulette and you know put this on red and the guy goes to the go, whole thing yeah no, no it was like maybe like fifty thousand. I and mean, he just like told him like I'm, I'm gambling here you go gamble for me over there so you know you're, there's a european roulette where there's like one zero there's only one green number so the odds of uh, the, the house is one out of 37 because there's 37 numbers and one of them is green. Mm. It's like 3% edge. So if you bet like $1,000, the house is going to win like $33, whatever. That's okay. In America, they have another kind of roulette called American roulette where there's a zero and there's a double zero. So the house actually has double the edge and it's a way to like fleece the customers faster. But this guy, he was in a high roller room. So they have the European one. He can bet on like the 3% edge. And he tells the guy, no, I want you to go put this on the one with the double zero because it's luckier or something, right? Because like you have to, he had some, some theory about how, you know, you should go against the, the odds. So he just willingly gave up edge to bet on a double zero roulette. And of course lost and needless to say, like lost all his money that day. That was just so disgusting to to watch. I mean, it was sad. Mm -hmm. um, it's imprinted in my head. Like I just, you know, I'll play gambling for for fun, but uh, as like a just for the sake of it, I I've seen how it, it can go really badly. What's the key learning there about the human brain? Yeah, I mean, some people really, you know, 
we're not adapted going back to like the evolutionary psychology we're not adapted to dealing with games of chance it kind of lights up these these weird parts of our brain and some of us can make really bad decisions is it because we don't want to believe that it's, a, that it's chance that it's luck you know the same as um, yes i i will leverage long for a month and bitcoin is going to go up and i'm going to make a lot and i'm going to think i'm amazing but yeah. actually it was just luck and yeah. then i'm going to get wrecked yeah i mean people have superstitions everybody like even top poker players will think oh because i wore, i wore this hat you know or I, i have this shirt on this is my lucky chip and this is why i win tournaments so I, they think that these things influence the chance when they don't it's uh it's a way for us to always be looking for meaning mm. when sometimes it's not there it's just it's just pure randomness so you're playing poker professionally but but at some point what what happens so i realized what happened after that yeah i mean at that at that point um i'd gone through that breakup um uh, reached a low point where i just wanted to get into like a life that felt more fulfilling and It wasn't so much about getting out of poker. It was more like finding something that that felt like I was going in the right direction, going with sort of like the flow where the universe was telling me to go. Um, so I did an MBA that was sort of like a year off to clear my head and think about what I wanted to do. Where was that? I was in Singapore. First time I oh, came to okay. Asia. Um, it's a great school, great opportunity. Um, I did my McKinsey interviews. I thought I was going to get back on that track. You know, because the university I went to, um, they don't even recruit out of there, like this McKinsey kind of people. And I thought mm. being a strategic thinker, I thought strategy consulting was was what was suited for me. I went to an MBA school that they hire a ton of people out of. So I, I get to the end of it and we do the interviews and, and I show up. I prepared really hard for these case studies. They give you like, uh, you know, you you read like two pages about some company and then you have to pretend you're a consultant and say what you would do. You would come into this company and you would you would do these studies and here's how you would you would act. So these like two German guys with like, you know, their suits and the the nice fancy McKinsey, like beautiful hair, like very, very nicely done. They sit me down. We go through a couple of case studies and uh, I'm just answering the questions. I'm treating it like the same I would as like a, like a poker game. I'm just trying to do a good job and solve, solve the game. So I get a call later th later that night because you know they they tell you if you if you're if you're getting through or not, and uh, the guy calls me directly like the McKinsey partner, and he says, "Hey, um, you know we spent a lot of time discussing you because we couldn't no, we didn't know what to do. We went back and forth many times. The reality is, you did like the best out of everybody on on the case study, but you don't seem like a consultant. You seem like a finance guy. You you just don't have that." You remind me of all my friends that are in finance. That seems to be like more your, your type of personality. So we're not sure what to do, given that you can do the job, but it doesn't seem suited for you. Um, so, you know, they were like, probably you should go do that instead. How did you take that? It actually gave me a lot of peace because I thought like, okay, I tried my best. Um, and I did I did a good job at the actual task, mm. but it's, it's, not where, it's not where the... The universe is kind of calling me. It's, it's, it's saying like, don't go here. And meanwhile, I have all these hedge fund managers that are trying to hire me because wow. uh, they're saying like, oh, trading is like poker. You should do trading. And I was very resistant to the idea because I, I wanted to get away from the world of poker and it felt too similar. Mm. But in the end, I kind of gave in. I said, okay, you know, like I tried, I tried to go down this childhood dream of McKinsey, whatever, but it, was, it wasn't the right one. So you're going for a trading career? Yeah. In the traditional finance word traditional finance why are so many great poker players such good traders it's definitely related to being able to think about expected value and being very process oriented rather than oh look i won oh look i lost they're very much focused on was this the right decision what were the probabilities could i have done something better this approach carries well extremely in the trading world So what happened in this traditional trading career? It was funny. So I had a couple ways to go. I could do discretionary trading, which is what probably I'm best at. I think I have a very, very high natural talent at just making decisions and having a very good intuition. It's something I was born with. I, t I chose the other path, which is uh, systematic trading. So, you know, you make algorithms 
And I had no idea how to code, never coded in my life. I'm with all these like MIT computer science kids. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're very proficient at 10 languages. And I'm just trying to piece together how to do Python. But the reason I was drawn and I decided to accept that path and that offer instead was because I was looking for the scalability where if you have code, you can just write 100 algorithms and you don't have to even be there. But if you're the one clicking the button, at some point, you know, you're, you're, you're exchanging time for money. And funnily enough, the only thing I could bring to that world of systematic trading, because I don't know how to code. Yeah, I'm good at math, but not, not like in a machine learning formal sense. I haven't done like a machine learning PhD like some of these kids have. So if you're not good at quant, you're not good at developing, what the hell are you there for, right? Like you shouldn't be in that industry. And I found a niche where I was passably good at the math and passably good at the coding where I could at least understand what was going on and be able to get through it. And I had a skill that nobody else had, which was I actually had the trading intuition. And most people, they're either intuitive or they're systematic. And going into systematic world with a lot of intuition, I could quickly find things that they were doing wrong. Like, you know, simple things. Let's just say there's an algorithm that works really well. Why not do double the size? Just size it up, right? Like you make twice the money. And they're not thinking about this stuff. They're just thinking how to optimize yeah. the R squared. <laughs> so I found opportunities to increase p and a lot in this world of systematic trading without um, being good at the actual, you know, zeros and ones of it. How long did you do that for? Uh, for forever. I mean, you know, I've kind of grown through that career. I started as a individual trader, did that for, you know, a couple of years at the first firm I was at, which was, you know, a very successful large HFT firm. Then I moved to the competitor, like the other really large HFT firm. Um, at that stage, it was a new team. So it was kind of ground from the ground up. There's no money, there's no PL. You have to kind of build it. So I got to see it, what it's like to go from scratch and actually create everything. Because in the first one, you know, you're just kind of tweaking knobs. Everything's already nicely done. All the code is, is nice and clean. So I saw what it's like to do that. I was maybe like the number two sort of person on that team, uh, but I wasn't the portfolio manager. And after a couple of years, um, I just thought, okay, like I, I, sh I should do this myself. I feel like it's like Eminem, you, know, you, you have this, you know, you look yourself in the mirror and you have one opportunity and you just want to go for it. And at that time I was making over a million dollars a year. Um, and going from that to just saying, fuck it, like, let, let me just go to zero and, and see if I can do it was, that was a moment where you have to believe in yourself. What made you, what made you take the leap? I just wanted this what, growth. Yeah, I, what's the moment we said, okay, now I'm just leaving this $1 million a year to do this thing on my own. I started to have opinions about the organizational side, not just the trading side, but the, you know, we were hiring, we went from like having three people on the team to having 20 people and people were leaving and like unhappy and the culture was, was a little bit messy. I learned of course that sometimes it's, it's okay to like hire fast and then fire some people because you still end up in a good place. Like you'll get 10 people, six of them suck. But if you end up with four that are good, you know, at the end of the year, may maybe you're in a good spot. So I, I learned some things, but I also didn't like the culture at all of what was going on. You know, all these math people, but they're very like high ego and they're, they're just very strong headed about things and they're fighting with each other. There was no direction. Mm. So I thought I would be good, good at that. Um, and that I would be good enough at the trading where I could kind of bring both. And I decided to um, kind of set up, set up my own team. When was that? So this is 2016. 2016, which is about six, seven years ago, right? Yeah. So I was 32. Um, it was a point in my life where you can start to try to push it to the next level. You know, I had enough money where I wasn't thinking about survival and that's very important. You know, when you're in survival mode and, and you're not sure how you're going to be able to pay for your rent, you know, for the rest of the year, that's, that's a very different place. If you've made a few million, let's say, and you can think about what's, what's the next step for you, then you, you can take a bit more risk. So how did this, how did this turn out for you? You know where I'm getting, <laughs> you know exactly <laughs> where I'm getting, because you said I mean, I'll, I'll get there. Yeah, yeah. You said there is this trade yeah, that you want yeah, to talk okay, about. Okay. So, um, you know, when I started 
from complete scratch and being you know the one actually driving the team and build, doing a proper build out. I needed somebody who was really good at coding. So, you know, I had somebody uh, that I was working with that was extremely experienced at building the coding stack. But even if you have a clear idea of what trades you want to do and that you've seen them before, you realize like in a different code base, in a different environment, you can't reproduce the same things. Just like these little details matter. And sometimes the same trade won't work. You have to adapt and just adapt to like the country that you're in, the reality you're in. Mm. You have to look around and say, okay, what advantages are there here? What, what things might be like restrictive? So you go from a place maybe where you had a lot of microwave towers sending data really fast and you can do some, some high, high speed trades. And then when you lose that, you can't try to do the same trade. It's not going to work. You don't have the same advantages. So I kind of built up the first years where the main focus was just make PL to be able to grow the team. And you end up doing different trades and trying out different things to see, to see what, what can, what can work. And had a few things going and sort of by chance, I found this one trade where it really used my intuition and it was a trade that I think nobody else could do as well because you really needed to piece information together from, you know, let's say eight different sources and merge them in a way that you can kind of predict, like, is it going to go up or down mm. by taking these eight sources of information? So this was this was a futures trade, trading like futures contracts. It's not like crypto where there's perpetuals and they, they keep rolling forever. Mm -hmm. These are calendar futures. Every three months, December, March, June, uh, September, they expire and there's a new contract. So when when there's like one week between the old contract and the new contract, it's called the roll, the futures roll. So this one week, there's a lot of people trying to move from the old contracts to the new contracts. And they have to kind of price the difference between the two. And I realized that I could sort of predict that price very well and how that price was moving. And I would use a variety of sources of, uh, of information to do that. Um, I'm not going to get into the, the, the details of how this is done because this is still available today. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, that's where people are disappointed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're, they're going to click stop. No, okay, so continue, yeah. So th this was a manual trade and it's going back mm. to my roots of being very talented at discretionary trading. It's not something that you can tell the algorithm what to do because there's unique situations that you have to react to and you don't know when they're, when, when they're going to happen. But at any time of day, 24 hours, because the market's open 23 hours, mm. something might happen that might need, might, might need you to sort of change direction and you have to be in front of the screen. And that can happen in the evening, can happen in the morning for the whole week. So for five days straight, if I really wanted to do this perfectly and extract the full amount from this trade. Which would be? So this would be a million dollars in, in one week. Okay. Every quarter. Every quarter. Available still today. Available still today. Amazing. Okay. <laughs> There's a little bit of variance. Sometimes it's half a million, sometimes it's two million. Mm. But on average, you, you know, it's, it's a very consistent thing if you're doing it properly. I would have to like take naps in front of my computer, just put a pillow there and take like five minute naps, you know, every five, six hours and hope that nothing happened and, and just have people call me <laughs> at, if, if any, if the market started moving and survive for a whole week. And this would be worth a million, a million dollars. I basically had to accept destroying my health and not sleeping and feeling like shit for five days for a million dollars. And so basically you've done that four times a year for six years. So about $24 million, but there is no freelance. Obviously the, the flip side is you don't sleep for five days or barely. And obviously you need time to recover from that. So it's not only these five days that you completely have a weird have a, a life and uh, fuck yourself over, but afterwards what's happening. I mean, the weekend is awful. The weekend after, you know, you're, you're trying to fall asleep, but your body's not used to it. And it, it's just angry at you. And I don't actually do very well without sleep. I, I start, you know, breaking out and having, having uh, just stomach aches and all kinds of issues. But there was a commitment I had where I felt guilty not extracting that value. Mm -hmm. I couldn't teach it to anybody else. It was something that I had to do myself. And ultimately, if I was wanting to make enough money to invest in the business so I could hire more people and keep growing, I saw it as a sacrifice that I had to make. 
how the hell do you stay awake for five days? It's rough. <laughs> Not just stay awake, but also stay focused. Um, this is where the years of chess helped out. Just having to sit at a table. When I was playing some of these uh, competitions, like the world chess under 18s and these things, they would put the games really early in the morning and I would be sleepless and have to just sit there all day. So I, I think I had a good amount of training compared to most people where I could do that. It was one of my superpowers, which I don't have anymore. I think if I tried to do this into like my 40s, I would have a harder time. How would you prepare for that? Because you know in advance the exact dates where you have that. So kind of like a Iron Man, you can prepare for it. So what did you do? First, I cut caffeine. No caffeine because I wanted to use that I wanted to have that sensitivity during that week. So you cut the caffeine for three months? Like, like not three months, but like, let's just say like two weeks before. Okay. No caffeine. So I go in, I have a game plan. Like day one, day two, day three, I kind of know how to, how to play it out. Like day one, I know I'm going to feel good. I'm kind of taking it easy. I'm relaxed. I know towards day three is when it gets really hard. <laughs> And that's where I kind of need some, some boosters, maybe some nootropics. Um, try to be smart, maybe accept that I will need to take like one hour uh, of rest at some point and, and get like, but when you take one hour after three days, you go immediately into deep sleep. Yeah. You're not, you're not just like having a nice nap. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're, you're like, and you wake up and you feel like. If something happens during that one hour, does it fuck the entire one million or a small part or like what happens concretely? Small part, usually like a couple hundred thousand. But if you, if you have a few of these events, you know, they add it's up. It's done. Yeah. And honestly, like, I always had like at least one fuck up where, you know, it would be like 1.2, but then it was one. And I would get, you know, I would get angry at myself. I would say like, you know, you have to be perfectionist. And I think from your personality, you can understand what I mean. Like, absolutely. <laughs> and, and this is how you get high performance. You have yeah. to treat every small piece with, with a view yeah. towards perfection. Yeah. Every one person makes a difference. Absolutely. What's the craziest thing that happened during one of these weeks that you remember? I mean, the, you know, the, there was one time where um, there was an insane move in the market that hadn't happened in, you know, all the 10 years that had previously uh, th these roles had happened. It might have been uh, on purpose or it might have been somebody just misclicked and they kind of ripped through, ripped through a book like crazy. So obviously the benefit of spending five days without sleeping is, uh, let's say $1 million, but what's the cost? What's the cost of not sleeping for five days? What's the life cost and what's the health cost? And did you even, because you're so analytical, did you even think about, because we both know that the quality, how much you sleep is directly linked to how long you're going to live and longevity, right? Did you calculate? I know I'm basically to get $1 million. This is how many days or weeks or months of life I'm kind of like giving up on? Well, first you're losing that week of life because you're literally not enjoying it. Like you're kind of becoming a robot. So you've already lost a week of your life and yeah. we don't have that many weeks. We don't have endless weeks of life. So you lost that week. Maybe you've potentially lost like another week of, of, of health. Okay. Um, so it was, a, it was a sacrifice I was willing to make. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that don't even have a million dollars. And if they could get that financial freedom by not sleeping a week, of course they would do it. And I, I felt like I need, I need to keep doing this even when I don't need the $1 million, you know, after five years of, because mm. this is not the only trade I'm doing. I'm doing a lot of other trades that are also making money, but this was just a consistent thing where I felt I needed to keep extracting it because anybody would, would, would give up a week for a million dollars, like unless you're Elon Musk. Mm. And this year is the first year I decided I'm not even going to do it. I well, think my time and my, my, my week is more important than a million dollars. And it's the first time that I've allowed myself to, to just ignore it. So what's the, what's the point? I mean, what's the moment where you realize that one week is not worth a million dollar? Is it because you reach a certain number or is it because of another sort of enlightenment and understanding, like kind of bigger understanding about life and happiness? I would love to say it's, you know, a bigger understanding, but it's mostly the first one because, you know, let's say, you know, going from one to two is a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Going from 20 to 21, still kind of, you know, 5% still matters. There's a point at which you say, okay, I'm giving up something 
how much is my time worth at this point? And I've spent a lot of time over the last decade making my time valuable. I really think about if I have a conversation with anybody, even with you right now, is this conversation worth $50,000? If not, I'm not going to have this conversation. I have to have that level. Mm. And I think, you know, it doesn't That's have to be- That's a great compliment. I don't have to be paid. <laughs> you don't have to like bring out a stack of cash and, and pay me 50000 But one of the ideas that I get from the conversation, either through organically talking with you or through some, you know, link that you're going to give me, oh, you should talk to this other person that ends up having a business deal that's worth Certainly. a lot. Absolutely. I have this standard now for, for my time and in a week I can achieve a lot now. But from a utility perspective, you don't want to get too rich too quickly either. I've met a lot of billionaires in crypto, like Do Kwan, a lot of other famous ones. I've met probably all of them. If you get, if you become a billionaire at age 30, it kind of fucks with you. What the fuck do you do afterwards? Yeah. What's the point in life? Yeah. What was the next thing you do? And that's the problem. They have to keep doubling down because they have to keep getting higher. They want the 10 billion. Yeah. And then I know a few that got to 10 billion. They, you know, they, they look at CZ or something. They're like, we're like, I, this guy is still There's above someone me. better. <laughs> and at some point they blow up. <laughs> is there a such thing as a number? Like as one number where, I mean, we both know it's not the case because you just talked about that, but that's the weird thing. And it's more, once I made it financially, how, how do I move forward with my life? So if you're trying to retire and you have a plan, I know people who, you know, they, they just want to go fishing and live somewhere in the wild. It's very easy for them in a way, like to achieve happiness. They can, you know, make 5 million. And then, and then retire and li live that life and they will. And that's fine. That's, that's fine. Some people are looking for that type of happiness. It brings them what they want. For me, like, I don't think about happiness. Like for me, I want to have the deeper satisfaction of achieving something that's very hard to do that has impact on the world, potentially that does good on the world. Not like this SPF bullshit, you know, putting the signs up, like I'm in crypto for good. None, none of this kind of stuff. It's more of a journey of, uh, of growth and personal growth. So satisfaction over happiness. Yeah. So it's almost looking at the much more micro view of progress and saying, okay, this is what I achieved today. I'm on the right track towards this big goal, but like actually reaching the goal is not the thing that's going to make me happy anyway. So I'm going to look at these smaller things, achieving them. So I have my satisfaction every day. This is what I've done or every week or every month. And then once the goal is reached, probably the goal, you always push it a bit further and further. But as you said, and that's very kind of very wise. And it's also something I learned through, especially the last crypto bull run. This, you don't want to make too much money too quick. And it's very counterintuitive, but because it fucks with your mind completely. And with your, with your kind of sense of kind of self-worth, and then you basically lost. And I know a lot of people also were, probably didn't make billions, but like their, the first reflex was, I mean, the first result was, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing now with my life. I'm in my 20s or am I 30 years old? And I'm basically, what am I going to do? Am I going to travel for the next 50 years, 50 years of my life? But who am I going to travel with? Everybody has a nine to five or whatever, nine to eight, or everybody's busy. You know, I even got during the crypto bull run and I have another company, data analytics, nothing to do with crypto, but you, you lose this the perception of like what money is. And I mean, you lose sense with reality, basically completely touch with reality and, uh, that kind of nothing makes sense anymore. And, and if you lose your, the problem is you, you talked about retirement, but like for people who are very entrepreneurial, if you lose your drive, you have nothing, you have nothing left, especially at that age. Yeah. It's nonsense. So like, I mean, the, people who retire at, you know, 65, they, they don't live very long after. If you retire at 80, you know, that, that's sort of a lot better. For example, you're, you're already, I don't know. I don't think I'll ever retire. I'll probably be like a Warren Buffett. It's not about money. Like I, I just want growth and, and progression and getting better. And I think that you can lose IQ points as you get older. You can become a little bit like less quick at things, but you can make up for it through the knowledge and the experience that you've gained. So you don't subscribe to the camp or theory that a happiness comes from the little things in life. Basically, I should be just very content with my coffee or, you know, do, do you meditate? Do you do all these things that make you kind of slow down and realize, actually, you know, I, 
kind of achieved all these things. And we have a bunch of like really big people on this podcast. And I often talk about that. And some say, no, I'm fine. I'm, you know, I deserve all that stuff. But a lot say, I've been chasing these numbers all my life. And then once I get there, I realize that I come back full circle because what makes me happy is the same thing that I could have had and appreciated without this money. Yeah, I mean, I'm not chasing a number and I'm not chasing a specific title or a specific goal at this point. I'm very adaptive to the world. And I've put together a team that I think is like very world-class, the smartest people and very self-driven. If we start tackling AI, because we think that, you know, right now we, we should get out of trading, get out of crypto and, and do like a different problem. We should use our collective mind power to do that. We'll do that. It's not a fixed target. So we're never going to reach that target. We're always going to be trying to use our talent in a, in a way that's positive. And that, that's a way that you keep the drive for forever. We have to talk about crypto a bit. <laughs> One of the things I want to talk about is Solana, because you said you were very right, as you said before, on a bunch of things, right? Uh, with uh, Luna and a bunch of other things. One of them, one of the things you said, I don't know if it was early this year or last year, you said, I think Solana is not going to reach back to the previous all-time high. My question is, why do you think it won't reach previous all-time high? And kind of in a more generic way is how do you look at value in crypto? So there's two types of value. There is actual cash flow where, you know, you have a DeFi protocol like Maker, it's making X amount of money a year and you can try to put a P ratio on it and decide what's this value. This is like traditional value. Then you have money value, like monetary premium type of value, which I think is extremely poorly understood by not just people in crypto, but even in traditional markets or in, in the world. Very few people understand what money means and what does it mean to have value. It's such a poorly understood concept of why would a coin have value or not have like, like this monetary value. And I'll, I'll say it's quite a serious thing. Um, it has this, you know, very light, ironic, as Elon likes to say, you know, aura around like a, a meme coin. But we, for me, it's like slavery. It's a serious topic. And I'm not talking about just like recent, you know, African-American slavery, just throughout you know, history and the Egyptians and everything, if people can force others to work all day for them and do what they want, that's slavery, right? Whether you're whipping them or whether they have to do it because they need food and you're the only one that can give them food, they're doing it for their survival. And with these kind of like cryptocurrency instruments that we've created, the ones that are not backed by a cash flow and they're, you know, like treated as a, uh, an alternative to the dollar or whatever. Mm -hmm. If somebody has 50% of the supply of Solana, let's say, where it's very centrally held by, you know, a few funds that were like in very early and, you know, FTX estate at this point as well. If we actually ascribe value to those things, and let's say we, you know, Solana goes back to $250, $300, and it's worth $100 billion. We're giving 50 billion of value which is the entire GDP of like large countries or, you know, like not to talk about like a country like Cyprus where I'm from, where it's not even near that. You can basically tell the population what to do for the entire year and just pay them a little bit of your Solana coins if we actually, as a society, agree that, yeah, it is worth $300. And it's not something to toy around with and, and, and just kind of make jokes about. There's, there's people that, will need to get that money to survive. There's limited resources in the world. And if we as a society decide that, you know, some random coin should be worth $100 billion, we're actually saying that the population of entire countries should work for the person who has it. And who has it? It's not a fair launch in the sense of, you know, everybody has a little bit of Solana. It is extremely highly concentrated in a few hands of people that have maybe like, the media, social media presence to pump it, or maybe just have like, you know, the insider presence. So your thesis is less, I don't think it will reach this price, but I don't agree with the kind of philosophical aspect or side of it. Well, or both. Both. So in order to be able to sustain that price, it means that society has accepted that this thing, we're, we're all, 
willing to work for Solana. Like you need to get out of bed and say like, gotta get my hundred soul today. Like, you know, I gotta, gotta chase that. And there's people who do that with Bitcoin. You know, they're, they're very fanatic about it. And I would say Bitcoin is a little bit separate from the others in the sense of, you know, it was created for that purpose, philosophically by the founder. It was created as an, as an alternative that people would, would work for. It has this first mover advantage. It has the sort of um, the aura around Satoshi, around the, the origin story that gives it some credibility as neutrality. You need this neutrality in order to have something have value. The value comes from so society and agreeing with each other. If something is not neutral, neutral means like, was there a pre-sale where somebody, some VCs got in, other people didn't get in? Was there something unfair about it? Or is it neutral? Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> What would 39 years old Jordi tell 19 years old Jordi if you met him today? Definitely the first thing would, would be around deconstructing the ego. Sometimes to be able to have a healthy, balanced ego that we've talked about, you have to break down what's there. And it's a little bit painful, it's uncomfortable because your self-identity is tied up with, you know, this person that you think other people see you as and um, where your value lies. You know, for a girl, it could be like people tell her she's pretty and her, her value is intertwined with this belief or it could be that you're smart and then you, you kind of attach to that. It could be around like your family. Your family is like a well-known family and, and you kind of, you, you like that aspect of it and it attaches to your ego. I would tell myself just, Accept like being nothing, accept being at a low level and just build in a very solid foundation where you kind of go step by step. You're not trying to be insecure and get ahead of yourself and show off to people that, oh, I can do this and whatever. Just be humble. Start from accepting that you will get better over time. You can kind of get there in steps and it's a much more solid way to build for the future. Yeah, so basically you're playing the game of life with yourself and the only thing that should matter is am I better today than yesterday, but not compare you, comparing yourself to others yeah, one way or another. Yeah, definitely like you can compare yourself to others to, to, to understand yourself better and get to know, okay, I seem to be, you know, naturally better at this kind of stuff, but then this is not my type of thing. So it's good to have that self-awareness. But the, the main thing is just not being you know, attached to your sense of self and your brain and this like noise in your brain. You know, I used to have, like I would, I would try to go to sleep and lie down at night and I couldn't sleep because I would just, you know, be thinking that, oh, well, there'll be a voice talking to me in my brain, right? I don't know if you, have you had this, the voice in the brain talking to you? No, the only thing I had that night was <laughs> it would be completely dark. I would put my cover above me and I would just like close my eyes, but it was dark already anyway. Stop breathing and be like, This is how it feels to be dead, basically. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of weird, but not the same. I mean, I, I think most people as they develop, <laughs> there's like a story being told to themselves about their reality and what's happening and, you know, just making sense of, of their world, right? And we sort of become a, a, a third character. Like we're just watching ourselves and there's two, there's two of us. There's the us that, is actually like living and doing things. And then there's the observer. Mm. What I kind of got through, through meditation and, and like a lot of years was that we are actually the observer and you just need to align the observer with your actions and your reality. The other stuff is like fake. The other stuff cannot lead you to a full, fulfilled life and happiness. Either. Yeah. You get jealous, you get upset, you know, you're in, you're, you're fighting with people you're taking things personally. Mm. I still sometimes will take things personally. It's like Michael Jordan. You know, you, you want to use it as motivation sometimes. If, if somebody doesn't believe in you, you kind of want to prove them right. And that, that's okay. Mm. If it's done within a boundary of um, control, it's, un, it's, it's under a certain limit. The breakup is a good example for that, actually. How do I use the breakup, especially if she breaks up with me as a way to fuel kind of my my future and become a, the, bet, the better or the best version of myself. So one day she would almost regret breaking up with me. 
Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's that's kind of true. Like in, in a way, it all comes down to being able to have value. If you want to get respect, if you want to get resources, if you want to achieve things, you just improve yourself, make yourself better. The rest sort of comes naturally. I went from like wanting to have a Lambo so that I could show off and like try to have the status that I was seeking, the social status. Have you ever had one? No, I just like flew from wanting to have it. And then when I could have it and it wouldn't be like a mistake to buy it, I just mm. don't crave it anymore. I might want to rent it for like a weekend just to have fun, yeah. but I don't, I don't need to own this thing. And you don't need to make the pictures to post on social media to show, hey, I have a Lambo, which no. I don't have, but I could have. <laughs> <laughs> so you're pretty active on social media. Actually, just for this podcast the other day, you generously posted about the fact that we would record and uh, I saw, I mean, you have a really sticky community, even during a bear market, like a lot of reactions from people, very excited which made me also very excited and which is going to force us to release this podcast next week. <laughs> Why do you do all this social media stuff? It's given, it's given me a lot of um, like satisfaction, this like inner satisfaction, being able to try to bring an authentic voice and say things how I see them and how they are. And I, and I think I have some unique perspectives that I don't hear other people talking about. So I, I do kind of bring something to the table that's not already there. And I love the the people that follow me on on the different um, social media channels because I've attracted a certain type of uh, talent that you know these are very smart people. Yeah, they don't like shit posts under my tweets. They're they're very nice and very thoughtful people. And I've met a lot of them in person, and it's just amazing to uh, to to meet this like high caliber of people. And you know the content that I put out and the things I talk about, it's not for everybody. I can't like talk to like the entire spectrum of of society. I do try to make it a little bit wide. So I use memes a lot. I think memes are just part of life. Like you can be very, you know, German philosophical and say like, no, you should just, you know, be correct and, and do everything properly. But, uh, you know, people have a short attention spans. Sometimes you have to get their attention with uh, an, an image or like a, a catchy quote. And you can have something to say very important behind it. But it just like has this extra punch because not everybody's going to read an entire book or you know, go go through like a ten thousand word uh, blog. So ultimately, I'm hoping to bring a little bit of memeness, a little bit of fun, but add my contribution to both. You know, the lessons that I'm learning through life, and the re the reason why I tweeted about this podcast, and I'm excited to do it. I'm like in the trenches every day right now. I'm I'm pushing 120 percent, where I'm out of my comfort zone, constantly keep pushing, keep pushing. I don't really have a lot of chance to like reflect and, and talk about what I've been discovering by being in the, in the trenches all day. And I love the idea of just once a while, a couple of times a year, step back and, and reflect. And so this is what we're doing. That's actually the goal of this podcast. I was just thinking, we have all these podcasts already in crypto about, you know, what's the next 100x coin or like all these very technical things. But at the end of the day, even if you have a, you know, a bored ape or a crypto punk on Twitter as a profile picture and you post a million or two million daily PNL, you're a human being. I mean, all of media is a game, not just social media. You know, you have traditional news outlets like Fox News and all these things. And they, if, they, if they manage to get attention through the right word by, you know, they use a lot of bad uh, things happening in the world to get attention or, or mm -hmm. anger and try to get people to... Um, look at a story in a way that will, will make them emotionally react to make them sticky customers. They're doing their game uh, for their fight for attention and trying to present their story, which can sometimes be, you know, not very mainstream, but they can make it mainstream by going that way. And crypto um, has this same image problem now where we're sort of being presented as criminals. They're bad people. They're trying to, you know, do all this shady stuff. And there is some of that obviously happening, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of people that actually care and want to do good um, for both the monetary system and also for individuals' lives. And yeah, we have to fight for that attention. Absolutely. And not be seen only as crypto bros or nerds, <laughs> but also as normal people, because that's how you attract the masses. Where do you think the human species is going to end, especially with um, the advancement of AI where we've seen massive breakthrough and progress in the last year? 
Yeah, it's been very sudden. I think we're, we're reaching this exponential chart on AI where it starts to improve itself very fast. And it might not be in the next couple of years, but I would say around the end of the decade, I would expect that certain, certain things about how we live our lives are going to change such a fundamental way that a lot of people will not be prepared for it. And um, for example, you know, if you have some AGI, uh, general intelligence mm. that can take a lot of people's work and just do it better than them, or even potentially give a lot of power to the people who are in charge of the companies or the code and create these superhumans that are able to control AI. Well, the rest of you know us plebs, I mean, hopefully we're <laughs> going to be on the other side of that funnel, who knows? But um, the imbalances between you know, the more powerful people and, and like the more uh, base people can get really extreme. And this is something we've already had, you know, in a capitalist society, you know, the CEO of McDonald's versus the worker, we see this ratio, you know, 100 times, 400 yeah. times sort of goes up. In a world where AI creates so much automation and intelligence, the few people that will have control over that will start to have some interesting ethical decisions to make as well. Because it's not just like, uh, you know, let's do UBI and throw money at people. I worry that something that's under discussed is what happens when there's such a huge gap where the difference between, you know, person A and person B becomes bigger than, you know, person B and like a pet where, you know, we love our pets, mm. we want to treat them well, but their consciousness level and their abilities is at, a, is at a different level playing field. And if you have some companies that are developing the level of intelligence that we're looking at seeing, it's going to bring a lot of ethical problems. How do we prevent that from happening? Because on one hand, and also linked to crypto, you know, you need to, you need to be careful with the regulation because you want innovation to happen. But again, how do you prevent from person A to person B being even further than person B to a pet? I think, uh, unfortunately, like it's some of these things are inevitable. <laughs> it's <laughs> like happen. Pro the progress We're of technology. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's hard to imagine exactly how it plays out because you know there's different companies, there's different countries. Um, there's obviously front runners right now with like OpenAI, and mm. at some point, I think national intelligence agencies start getting involved in the AI rights, just like they did during the Cold War. So it becomes an issue for national security, and they start interfering and, and wanting to be on top of all the developments once they once they get to that level. I think we're only a few years away from countries like city states uh, being involved. Probably in China, they're already involved. It's hard to know exactly what's what's happening there. But because it's an arm race, it's hard to stop it. So we have to think about like, what's the value of a human life? Like, what if it's a human life that, you know, doesn't have anything to contribute to capitalist society anymore? Because mm -hmm. a capitalist society is, so, is sort of built on this premise that, you know, some people are cutting wood and some people are working in an office and we're all putting all this stuff together as a society, it makes sense. And if someone is not contributing at all, yeah, if we have extra resources, we'll, you know, we'll give them something, some welfare. But in a world where it's it's like that to the extreme, we haven't thought about that. And this makes the assumption that the people who make these decisions at the country level even understand what's happening. But when you look at politicians, just just when you look at social media, you know, Facebook and you look at the Congress and the type of people who are supposed to make some decisions that they don't even understand anything about, and we're just talking about Facebook and data. We're not talking about AI, right? Yeah. <laughs> the only thing people understand is money. Like these people will understand incentives. So once this level of wealth, which is already, I mean, we're seeing these valuations like open AI, 90 mm -hmm. billion, even that's probably like going to be lower than when, where we're going to start seeing these Anthropic and, you know, all these other companies. The level of wealth that is going to get created now is never been seen in history before. And it can happen very suddenly where, you know, trillions of dollars get created by somebody who makes the next advancement. Mm. And that will sway politicians, it will sway, it will sway countries. 
goes back to, you know, this concept of if you have that much wealth, people in essence are, are your slaves because they, they're working all day trying to get some of what, what you have. And as a capitalist society or even a non-capitalist society, um, you know, we have to think through what, what, what we want the end game to be. What do you think it is? I think ultimately um, the U.S. government will start having a lot of control because a lot of the developments are happening there right now. Most of the, the companies are, are based there. Um, and yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if we end up in a sort of Russia, USSR, U.S. part two, but with much higher stakes. So despite not... We didn't talk about that today, but despite not being very bullish on the U.S., you still think that they're gonna win this race. So I mean, you know, the U.S. I feel like as a as a society, the coherence of the people is falling apart. There's just more crime when people are not having resources. I don't blame them. Like mm. they are so frustrated at the system, they're angry at the system. Even if they do stupid things, you know, when I was living in San Francisco, they would throw rocks at the at the Google bus. And it's just some normal people inside the bus trying to go to work, but they would, they would express their anger at the big tech that was gentrifying and making things more expensive by, by like attacking the Google bus. These types of things will, will keep progressing. And the U.S. is at the stage where we're seeing more and more of that. There's a lot of you know, societal discontent around wealth and the imbalances, and that will only keep getting worse. Mm -hmm. At the same time, at the, at the high level, they still have a lot of power with the technology and the innovation is, ma is mainly happening there. Amazing, man. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks. That was amazing. I hope you had fun. Had a lot of fun. We'll do it again. Absolutely. We'll do it again. Hopefully when the, the crypto market is a bit less boring. <laughs> But uh, the most important is we are always at the top of ourselves, doing a bear market, doing a bull market, and um, to make things move and make things happen. Yeah, let's keep trying to think forward, improve things, and get better both for ourselves and the people around us. Amazing. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks. Thanks.